screen is used for is that I stream all of my classes on YouTube. Nice. Yeah, I like your face. That's good. Like, <laughs> what? So yeah, I have a YouTube channel. It's free. Um, you, if you ask the Google for it, you'll find me, and pretty soon here you'll see the live stream. These are all the previous classes um, that I have streamed on here in case you want to learn about other things. Yeah, so this is going to be stored here. On the website, so that you don't have to dig through YouTube, though, and get lost in cat videos or something by accident. I know how that goes. Um, I will post the videos next to all the lectures. So the reason I do this is se several. Um, I assume that all of you are grown-ups. You have your own lives, your own responsibilities, and they include other things besides this class. So if you have to miss class for whatever reason, fine. I don't take attendance. I trust that you all can manage your own schedules and decide when you can be here and when you can't. If you can't be here, you can participate later on by watching the video. Um, if you know in advance, if there's enough people who are going to be gone, I can set up a, uh, a Zoom link so that you can Zoom into the class and we can start doing it that way if you'd like. Um, the other reason is that it, I've taken a lot of stats classes and a lot of workshops, and I can't even tell you how many times I thought to myself, you know, if I could have just heard that one more time, I would have had it. You can listen as many times as you want. So if you're listening to the lecture here and it's not getting in, you go home, you listen to that part again, it's still not getting in, then we can talk. But hopefully having something to refer back to will help. Um, the reason that that is going to be especially important in this class is that I'm not overly fond of the readings I picked. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, I spent a good chunk of the summer looking for something I was fond of and didn't find it. A lot of the introductory stats books um, focus a lot on formulas and hand computations, and we're just not going to do that. So I'll tell you more about that in, in the lecture, but just know that um, I gave you two options for textbooks, one which is inside ICON. It's a PDF download. I found it for free, so I'm le legally, I think. Um, and so, I mean, this, the site looked legit, right? It wasn't, you know, like, <laughs> you know, stolen documents are us or whatever. Um, I think it's because the, the textbook has multiple newer editions, and so they're starting to release the older ones for free, and I can't tell that much has changed when I looked at the newer ones, so it's fine. Um, I also have this book that is on the reading list, which is really just a Stata book. So someone asked me about this book and said it wasn't here yet. Was that you? Do you want to look at it? No, that's fine. Okay, well, I can pass it around so you can see what it is. I think if, if Stata is something that you're going to continue to use in your um, stats courses and in your analyses, I, I like this book, but it has little to do with the content. It's just once you understand this concept, here's how to ask Stata to do it for you. And so it's not sufficient as a way of learning what the concepts are. So um, lecture materials, videos, that's going to be your go-to for reviewing things. Um, let's see. I think that's all I want to say right now because I don't want to get on off a rant. To protect myself from doing that, I decided to put everything in slides. How's that sound? Okay. So let's uh, start this off. Did ever, does everybody have the website or access to it? Um, if you ever can't find the link again, by the way, you can just ask the Google for me. Because my mom spelled my name wrong, I own the Google. It's Lisa Hoffman with L-E-S-A. So you put me in and I will, f I will pop up first. Yeah, there's, there's my lovely head that I cropped out of one of the two pictures of me that exists, I think, since I you know, got out of high school. But um, so you can find uh, on my website, I have teaching. Here it is, course materials. And then all the courses that I've taught at the three universities I've worked at um, are there, so you can find that anytime you need to. All right, so what to expect? Let's do this. Um, informally, you can expect that I'll probably be slamming Diet Mountain Dew. Um, you're welcome to bring whatever lunch or, or food that you have with you. Just please don't spill it on the computers or someone's going to yell at me. So let's put that out there. So reasons why you are here. For some of you, it may be because you have no choice, you have a quantitative requirement, and that's why you're here. That's fine. I hope to convince you otherwise, but if not, at least you've met that requirement and you can go on with your careers. But why I think you should be excited to be here is to learn about quantitative methods. Note that I'm not calling this a statistics course. Quantitative methods is really what this is about. It's how do we answer questions about data using statistics to do so. 
So we have this process of summarizing data and the patterns in data that occurs through statistical modeling. So when you start with data and questions and you apply statistics to answer those questions, that's the field of quantitative methods. I love it so much that that is why I am here. That is my research area. That is my teaching focus. That's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, I was one of those people who did okay with math in high school, but I thought it was useless. It's kind of like, well, okay, yeah, I can find f of x, but like, why do I care? Like, why does that matter in my life? And I went to college and majored in psychology because I was going to help people. And you didn't know, need to know math to be in psychology, but huh, turns out you do. Because one of the first classes I had to take was research methods and statistics. And guess what? There's math again. And it's not very challenging math, but it's concepts I hadn't gotten used to in a while. Given that that class was so exciting for me and I ended up specializing in this career, that lack of math has come back to haunt me. I'll just tell you that. It's because when you read things about statistics, like the handout that I was looking for that's filled with formulas, it's like a foreign language. And if you're not fluent in that foreign language, it's real easy to get overwhelmed. So I'm going to try to focus on this idea of methods. It's not about the statistics. It's about what's, what family of options is going to be best suited for these data and this, these questions, and what do I do with the information the program is going to provide me. Not Excel, not a hand calculator, but the program, because that is how modern data analysis works. Turns out, though, side note, I do still think of myself as helping people because I provide consultation and collaboration to people who are trying to do data analysis. So it is kind of like a therapy type thing, and people do cry in my office periodically. <laughs> um, so it's I'm kind of, you know, full circle. So in terms of what where this class fits in in the grand scheme of things. This is a slide that I made um, in discussions with the rest of our program, thinking about how do we pitch our courses and what their objectives are and who their persons that would be most benefited by them. So I've highlighted in yellow sort of where we are right now. An introductory level course, really the only outcome that I think is reasonable is to be a competent consumer. If this is the only class that you take, Hopefully you will be able to read journal articles in your field that use quantitative methods and at least follow along to some extent to know whether or not their conclusions are horribly wrong or probably okay. Probably okay is where the gray area gets, that's where it gets harder. If you're willing to keep going, then we get into additional competencies with additional classes. You have the skills to conduct your own data analyses for anything that's not just a very simple case. And note that this slide extends not only to people who are PhDs in measurement and statistics. Raise your hands. I know I've got a couple of you self-identified. People are like, ah, there's three, see? But other folks. I have trained a good number of people who are clinical psychologists, counseling psychologists, school psychologists, um, people from communications, people from business, people from all over who have just gotten a knack for this and they've taken all the classes and they have a level of quantitative expertise that they can sell as another focal area on the job market besides what they came to do. So the, do the, the door is open. The, the choices are yours as to how far you want to go. I just want to be realistic about what you can reasonably expect out of one course as a requirement. So what are we going to do? Applied math. We are going to understand the logic behind the uses of statistical models. And given, let me back up for a second, I have been teaching PhD level advanced quantitative methods for, this is my 14th year in the profession, and I was a postdoc for a couple of years before that teaching a class. And I'm really excited about the chance to do this class in particular, because there are so many things that are typically taught as part of an introductory stats course that honestly I haven't thought about in 20 years. Like, I, like you just, they're not part of the normal modern vocabulary and sets of procedures. And there are, but there are things that I wish people had learned sooner because it really had nothing to do with what I was gonna focus on in the advanced class, but it was a prerequisite. So I'm coming at this course from very different perspective. I'm coming at it from what would be the most efficient way to get you from here to there, to the advanced courses, if that's where you wanna go. How, how much information can we put in this course that's going to be immediately relevant and not antiquated? So that requires a different approach and focusing on different things than what you would typically expect in an intro stats course. We're not calculating anything by hand. Let's put that out there. At most, hand calculations will occur in Excel. That's it. 
Because in real life, I don't do that. What we will do is use software. And we'll talk about software in a minute, but that's how things really work. And so that's a really important skill that you need to be able to have. We are not gonna derive formulas or results. Here's, here's my pitch. It is okay to trust the people who've already figured this out. That's not my job. That's not your job. Think about how you got to work today. Did anyone drive yourself to work in a car? Right? How many of you could give me a detailed explanation as to how your car works? Nope. Does that mean you're a bad driver? Different purpose, right? In fact, when I take my car to the dealership and they tell me my wishy-wonky needs replaced, I'm like, is that a thing or am I just you know, being taken advantage of? The same is true in statistics. There are, uh, there are statisticians who may or may not know anything and without quality control, you don't know the difference. And so that's one of the reasons to be in this class in addition, but no, it's okay to trust the people who figured this out and use their work. Um, same with the formulas. You don't need to memorize formulas, you don't. The computer programs have them implemented by people who know better and who have programming skills to make sure things are numerically stable. So it's not about that. It's about logic and language. That's the hard part. And when I say language, it's twofold. Words, which was what you think of when you think of language, but also notation. The symbols, the Greek letters, the English letters, and the way of expressing the models is a language. And it's something you have to work to become familiar with, just like any other foreign language. So that's what I want you to focus on. Because when it comes time to st tell people about your results, those are the languages you're going to need to speak, words and equations. Um, I'm much more on the word side, just as an example. Um, I, you know, equations make me a little nervous. Like at first I have to sort of be like, okay, don't know, you know this, you know that one, you know that symbol, you know that one, okay, it's cool. In contrast, um, my husband, also new faculty here at Iowa, he's the other way. So I remember one time I was showing him a textbook that I liked and I thought this person did a great job explaining something and he looks at it and he goes, words, words, <laughs> words. He gets to an equation, oh, huh, yeah, that makes sense. Here you go. Like, no, that's not me. But you're going to have to talk to people who are going to want the words, and people are going to say, words, words, what's your model? And so I want you to be able to talk to both of those types of people. The latter may be on your dissertation committees. So, so in terms of assessment, the most important thing that you can do is get hands-on practice. We're not doing tests. I've never given a test in my whole career. We're not doing it. It makes you nervous. The skill to sit in a room and dump your brain without resources is probably something you're never gonna have to do in the rest of your life. And so it's not something I want you to practice. Um, the, the homework that I give you is going to be about data analysis. It's going to try to train you for the kinds of things that you really need to be able to do to complete a thesis or a dissertation, as well as any other research studies. And I'm trying to give a context to everything that I do so that it's not just here's the T statistic. It's like, well, what would we use this for? What, what, is, this, what is its greater purpose? So what are we going to do? Two things, um, formative assessments, which somehow the motiv only got highlighted here. I'm gonna fix that. A, uh, someone once told me the best advice, make sure you fix your typos right away mm -hmm. so they don't come back a year from now. So there, got that. Um, anytime I do have typos, by the way, I will post the new version of the slides after class. So just in case there's anything that I need to fix. Formative assessments. Um, I am told that is the nice educational speak for quiz. <laughs> the way that I use these though, and your first one is due next week, is as a chance for you to check your understanding of the big picture. I'm going to put on ICON uh, three to four questions that are sort of big picture questions, things that you should know off the top of your head or with very little emphasis to go and look at. If you don't know, that tells you what you need to go back and review. Um, each one of these is gonna be worth about two points. I have seven planned in the syllabus. They happen on the off weeks between homework and you get points if you try. I'm not grading these. I will give you the correct answer and we will go over the answers in class the day that it is due. So it's okay to be wrong. It's also okay to leave me notes to say, well, I couldn't find this, where is it? Or something like that. So this is just your chance to check your understanding, what needs to be reviewed, uh, resolve inconsistencies, and with low stakes. Homework assignments, I don't have ready yet because I'm waiting to see how many people add or drop in terms of this class. 
but they're going to be completed um, about every other, every second or third week on the schedule via an online homework system. This is something that is a piece of software that someone uh, else started that I've taken and tried to run with to administer homework. It's going to give you a chance to do data analyses on individual data sets. I will ask for numbers as answers for various things. You will enter the number that you think it is. If it's right, it turns green. If it's wrong, it turns red. And you keep trying until you get it right. And you know that it's right. If you get stuck, you ask for help. Then, after you, I can be sure that you have all the right numbers, comes the interpretation, because that's the harder part. This, I don't get to give you feedback on until after you submit it. But the idea is to be able to put words with the interpretations, and it's in a multiple choice format. So it's either going to be multiple choice questions or it's going to be drop down menus in the style of Mad Libs is what I would say. Am I dating myself? Do you know what Mad Libs is? Okay, the young ones do? Okay, good. I'm good then. No? So it's like Mad Libs is when you have like a story and it's like there once was a and then you're supposed to put noun. And the person that provides these words doesn't know what the context is. You just ask for a noun or a verb and so then the story is really funny because, you know, it's Mad Libs. So it'll be drop down menu. Um, is significant, is non-significant, or is positive, or is negative. And so you're, you have to interpret it, and the idea is that then by the time you're finished, you have a template for what a results section would look like to describe these analyses. Because results sections in manuscripts are really, really formulaic. There literally is a template that you can follow and just stick things in for most common types of analyses, and so I want to give you that secret. So. That's what I'm going to have you do instead of hand calculations and tests. We cool with that? Okay. Um, with respect to homework, next week I'm going to ask you to complete with me in class a homework zero, which is over the syllabus and it's just designed to make sure that each of you can access the system and learn how to use it. It's super simple, but I want to make sure that I demo it. If you complete it, you get three points extra credit out of 100. I don't do like fancy math. <laughs> now the reason you might need that three points of extra credit is because I am a hard ass when it comes to deadlines. Let me say that again, I am a hard ass because things with deadlines get done. See the IES grant submission held that I've been in for the last two weeks. IES has a hard deadline of Thursday and if you don't have it in by Thursday you have to wait a whole nother year. Things with deadlines get done so I want to encourage you to put the deadlines, take them seriously. Um, if you miss uh, a deadline, it's three points off. So there's no like one point per day or any of that, it's just three points. So I'm basically giving you a free late homework to start the semester. Um, it's another reason for that is because I want to be able to go over the homeworks in class and I can't do that if not everybody's done. Um, that being said, I am also trying to be reasonable. So I have a policy in the syllabus that if you know in advance that you're going to be likely to miss a homework deadline, you're at a conference, a family event, something like that that's planful, shoot me an email if it's two weeks in advance and we can work out a new deadline for you. Last minute things I try not to say yes to because I want to be fair to folks. Um, most of the homeworks right now I have planned to be due on Monday nights. That way you have the whole weekend to work through it. And 11.59 uh, p.m. is the official deadline. So that is according to the server that runs the homework in that. So we're going to practice real life data analysis. That's my goal. So questions on that. And everything I'm saying is in the syllabus, by the way. This just makes me uh, stay a bit more organized. No? What do you think so far? Less scared? Maybe? A little bit? No tests? <laughs> I'm happy with that too. Yeah. So my job. I am here to provide custom lecture materials. Because I'm not happy with the book, I have to do everything myself. Um, the internet makes that a lot more, uh, makes that a lot easier. So um, you will see in my slides that I have borrowed slash stolen various diagrams and examples from places that I found, but I give you the link to where I got it from in case you, um, just for attributions purposes, but in case you want to find more details about that. So I try to give you examples for everything that you're going to have to do. So when we're doing data analyses, I will have done one with you, and I will give you annotated syntax and output for it, so that all you have to do is figure out how to adapt it to answer the question that's in your homework. That's the goal. Um, I don't want you spending hours Googling Stata code or SAS code because that's not a good use of your time. 
Um, I also promise to answer questions via email, individual meetings, or office hours. So the way I do office hours may be different from what you're used to. I'm gonna stand in this room for an hour on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 3.15 to 4.15-ish, and you can hang out, work on your homework, and if you get stuck, I can help you, and then you can move on. So that works really well um, to make it so that I can get to multiple people quickly rather than making an appointment. It's on a drop-in basis. Um, if you know that you want to have a more um, extensive conversation and not have me have divided attention, let me know and we can schedule a meeting else uh, other times. Um, your responsibility. Asking questions. That's the big one. I know people are really afraid to look dumb. But the dumb thing is to sit there and not follow because you're wasting your time, right? Don't be afraid to look dumb. Can I tell you a brief story? It's a bit of a humble brag. <laughs> So when I was a postdoc, I went to a workshop um, on M plus software. I don't know if you, some of you have heard of that, maybe? No? Okay. Well, it's two people who wrote the software program, and the workshop had like 200 people in the room who had each paid $200 a day for five days. And the program itself costs $1,000. Um, so yeah, these people sleep on a bed of money every night, I'm pretty sure. Um, but they were great presenters. They had a policy that so that they could get through everything, they were supposed to hold questions until the end of the day. So I was sitting there towards the back of the room. I still had good eyesight, so I didn't have to get you know, all the way in the front. And we each had a name tag that had where we were from more prominently, which was Penn State, where I was a postdoc, and then my name. I asked so many questions during that week that the presenter himself, Bent Mutain, saw me in the elevator, and he goes, ah, Penn State. <laughs> he recognized me. Fa that was 2004. Fast forward to last year, I was reviewing a paper that he was an author on, and he cited the textbook that I wrote several times because he liked the way I explained something. And I was like, holy shit, <laughs> Ben Utain knows who I am. <laughs> so a bit of a humble brag, but I was really proud of that. I don't think I would have ever gotten to the point where I could explain something well enough that someone who knows way more than me liked it without asking questions. Please. And you know the adage, like if you have the question, someone else probably does too, right? That's okay. Um, and if your question is, I'm not following and I don't know why, like that's okay too. Like if you don't have enough to articulate a question, we can try to back up to make sure that we get to where you are. Um, let's see. I'm also going to ask for answers a lot. So this is the way that I teach is it will go through an example and I'll say, okay, well, here's a two. What does this two mean in this context? And I know it will happen. Everyone's going to sit there. Some of you may know, some of you and be too shy. Other people may have no idea. But that looks remarkably similar from my perspective. If you're, if you're bored, uncertain, shy, like that's all. <laughs> so think about a spectrum of correctness of answers, right? The most incorrect answer you can give is none. We don't want that. I can't work with that. Then there's sort of uh, this. Or, I think this is wrong, but I'm not sure why. That one is my favorite, because there's a, there's a misconception that I need to cor that correct, that that's what that tells me. Or then there's correct, which is great, but I want you to be able to articulate why. So it, wrong answers are actually preferable because they're teaching opportunities. So don't be afraid to get it wrong. No one's going to judge you. I have no idea what that was. OK. Hi. <laughs> um, let's see. Review the class material frequently. That's the thing I'd like you to do in lieu of spending a lot of time reading. I go over things, and as part of your review, practice. So I'm going to give you opportunities for practice, but they will not touch the amount of learning you will do if you practice with data that are meaningful to you. So if you don't have data that you're working on right now, ask your advisor. I am quite certain they do and just go through and try to do what we're doing on the data. And I would love to answer questions like, here's some output. Can we go over this to make sure that I know what this means? That's my favorite kind of question thing to do in office hours. So those are the things you can do sort of filling in between to make sure that you're practicing the skills. Um, for those of you who are in quant programs especially, learning extra programs while you're doing this. So um, all of you should have a section on your CV that says technical skills. Any additional programs that are sort of off the beaten path, not like Excel, but things like 
you know, HTML coding or C++ or specific um, programs for qualitative data analysis, anything like that is your technical skills section. Every additional statistical program you learn is another entry, right? And we can never have too long of a CV at this point, right? So especially for you guys, because it, we don't know where you're gonna go after this, who you're gonna work with, and each person usually has a favorite software program or two. More, more things that you can try to learn, the better. Um, let's see, the textbooks, I already covered that. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, the 15 minute rule is what I was taught a long time ago and I think it's still good. If you're stuck on something for 15 minutes and you can't figure it out, stop. Send me an email or ask someone else. Um, but struggling endlessly is just going to make you more angry than anything else. All right, so software. Good news, you're not paying for this. I was really pleased to find this out when I moved to Iowa that you have this virtual, uh, what is it called? De virtual desktop. Yeah, I keep thinking virtual machine and knowing that's not right. Um, so yeah, I have pledged allegiance this semester to two different programs to try and keep everybody happy. SAS, which is my the thing that I didn't grow up on, but I've grown to love. I grew up on SPSS, started there. Picked up enough SAS um, as a postdoc to be able to automate a lot of the things that I was spending lots of time on, and that's been invaluable. Um, I picked up Stata under duress at a summer workshop. So have you heard of ICPSR? It's, a, it's an institute out of Michigan. They run summer workshops all over the country. Um, so I signed up to do a four-week version of that, and I had a workshop prepped using SAS. I get to that four-week workshop, and I'm like, okay, here who knows, here who knows SAS? No one. What do you all use? Stata. Every single person. I'm like, oh, apparently I'm learning Stata. So it was a crash course in Stata. So that is to say, if you are a heavy duty Stata user, you may know more than me. I've learned enough to figure things out. And that's why I like this book, because I'm still kind of a novice. So I'm going to give you examples in both of these programs. You are free to choose which one you like. I've tried to give you some advice. Um, if, if I had my druthers, you would all learn both again, for the technical skills, but I'm being realistic. Um, learning one is probably a good goal for one semester. Um, in terms of where you're gonna do your homework, I found out the hard way that Stata is only available on the virtual desktop from campus. So that may, may be the deciding factor right there because SAS is available from anywhere. Um, if you have a computer at <coughs> school that you can remote desktop into, then it's still on campus, but if you're just law, if you're working on this stuff elsewhere, um, then it's only going to be stated. By the way, the online homework can be done anywhere, so that's not um, that's not part of an Iowa thing. That's our own thing. Um, other things to think about: if you're on the fence as to what to focus on, ask your advisor. Uh, talk to other people in your program to see which of these is going to be more useful in terms of your future classes, your future research, and that kind of stuff. And as I said before, I'm also know SPSS really well. Um, M plus, the, the software that's, you know, made of money, and like this much R, like this much, I, I, I hate R, I'm not going to lie. Um, everyone's like, oh, you need R, you need R, yes, I know, but I don't want to, it's like Brussels sprouts, so I'm getting there. I can read R, I know, and the Brussels sprouts have made a comeback. Yeah. For me, okay, it's like peas, it's like canned peas, how's that? Yeah. Canned, exactly. <laughs> I grew up on canned peas and canned green beans, and I'm just, no, I'm a grown-up now, and I'm not going to do it anymore. <laughs> um, the other thing is that our, it's free, it's free. Well, there's an expression, you get what you pay for, right? And so I trust the programmers behind Stata and SAS more than I trust some dude in his basement making up packages and putting them online. So just put that out there, that's my bias. So. But I am going to be dragged kick and screaming into it because it's the way of the future. And I know nothing about Python. So if you want that one, good luck. I'm just telling you, I, I can't help you there. Um, so do you guys know any of these programs yet? Not yet? A little bit? OK, let's see, survey. No, what are you talking about? I just didn't get any of the jokes because I have never <laughs> heard any of these things. That's OK. Truly, I thought Stata was statistics plural. So I, oh, yeah. yeah, that would make so sense. One of those like, eh, people over oh, okay, so. Yeah, by the way, um, Stata in capital letters is incorrect. This is me like like trying to stick it to the man because Stata is lowercase only, and that drives me bonkers. <laughs> um, and so whenever possible, I'm just like, eh, put it in uppercase just to mess with them. But SAS is always uppercase. Okay, that's cool. 
So that's fine. I mean, this introduction, right? That's where we are. Blake's late. There you go. <laughs> it totally is. So let's see. Knows none of this couple? Okay. What do you know? SPSS is all I've heard of in our department. Okay. Heard of or used? Oh, I've never used it. No. Okay. Heard of. Okay. Anyone else know any packages? SPSS. 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 Yes. Okay. That's cool. No, the reason that I'm not doing SPSS is because you can't grow with it. That's the problem. It's like SPSS as to, is to the hardware section of Walmart as SAS and Stata are to Home Depot. Okay? Like if I, we could totally do SPSS for everything in this class, but then you'd be stuck with it and like it doesn't go with you. So I'm, star I'm starting with things that if you want to keep going, they can go with you. That's my rationale. Um, SPSS is also provided in the virtual desktop, so if you know that you're going to keep needing to, to use that program, practice the stuff that we're doing in SPSS as well, and I can help you figure that out. By the way, the Windows versus Syntax things, um, all of these programs have drop-down menus. We're not going to use them, but if you don't know how to find something, they're a great place to start. Um, for the sake of reproducibility, though, we'll work with Syntax. Basically, what you can do is ask for the command through the windows and hit the equivalent of paste and it generates the code that your choice is elected and so then you know what you picked which is really important plus you can copy paste and modify it easily to do other things all right so here if you're deciding between the two here is my opinion as to which is better for certain things um, i just wanted to put that out there um, most of this will not yet be relevant for us but um, just to be in the interest of transparency. So what are we going to talk about this semester? We're starting off today with words, a lot of words, um, research and data terminology, because like anything else, there, it's jargon heavy. Um, in, in univariate statistics and bivariate. So we'll learn these terms, but univariate means one, one variable at a time, uni. Bivariate, can you guess what that means? Thing. See, we're already right there. Look at all these new words you know already. Uh, general linear models, we will learn what each of those pieces means. So this is more like at the end of the semester, you're going to look back at this list and go, huh, I know what she's talking about, it's cool. Um, so that is the list. If you want to talk to your advisor, for instance, about what we're going to be doing this semester, this is the list that you can show them. Um, we're hopefully, time permitting, going to get into multivariate. So if uni means one and bi means two, what do you think multivariate means? Lots, right? Multiple, yeah. So um, that's for situations in which you have more than one outcome per person specifically. So that's where we'll eventually get to like repeated measures. And then some special cases of stuff uh, time permitting. So that's my goal. But we're starting with the basics. So um, as a plug, you may have been told um, erroneously that this course is a terminal course, that if you take this, you can't take anything else. That is no longer true. That used to be true. But with the advent of two new faculty in our program who are offering new courses, we have more options. So I want to put in a plug right now for something that I view is the second half of this course. That's what I intend it to be. Um, it's going to be uh, 2 o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the spring. It's called Applied Generalized Models. So it's going to extend what you know to other types of outcome variables. So no worries if you don't know what that means yet. Just want to put in a plug because I think this is going to help you transition into being able to analyze your own data. There's always a saying that you learn like the thing in the first course better when you do the second thing. Like you learn, um, you know, trigonometry when you do calculus or you learn addition and subtraction when you do algebra, like those kind of concepts. For, if for no other reason, that will be good. Um, in terms of other classes that 6242, this class is a, an acceptable prerequisite for. Um, here's the list. Anything that's taught by me. Uh, I'm doing a clustered multi-level modeling class after this one. Last spring I did a longitudinal. Um, Dr. Aloe does design of experiments. That's a very popular class um, added uh, every year. Uh, Dr. Lebeau does uh, computer packages. He teaches R, so if you need to learn R, he's really good at it. It's nice to know someone who uh, has those additional skill sets. For me, I ask him questions about that all the time. And if you're not sure what would be good for you, given your research and your timeline for graduating, but we can chat. So if someone tells you, oh, well, you have to be an intermediate to do this, this, and this, it's not actually true. It's instructor discretion. 
So certain people think intermediate is the only acceptable prerequisite and certain people do not. That's what it boils down to, okay? Cool. So, questions so far? I'm gonna pause, reload. I swear this is just caffeine. No questions? You're good? All right. So I don't know where all you guys are coming from yet in terms of your background. I'm guessing it's what we would call heterogeneous, right? Mm -hmm. Everywhere from I have no idea what you're talking about yet to, yeah, I've, I've heard these things before. So I'm starting at the beginning. I'm giving you um, the vocabulary today that we're going to start working with, and next time we'll start talking about data, um, distribution, statistics, and things like that for univariate. So let's give an example. Let's say that someone is doing a study on graduate student life, hypothetical situation here, and they're using a survey to collect self-report information about one's program membership, their levels of stress, and their well-being. Okay, so even though this is not phrased as a question, let's just think about it as well-being is what we're going to call an outcome, a thing to be explained, and program membership and stress would be predictors, the explainers. So what do we want to know? In doing this study, what is the overall purpose? Who do we want to know it for is the first question. That's our population. So are we interested in generalizing what we find to graduate students in the College of Education, graduate students in Iowa, graduate students in the world? I don't know. That's something you have to think about and decide how we're going to figure that out. Um, the characteristics of that population, sort of the big picture, those are called parameters. The characteristics of the people that you have data for, your sample, those are called statistics. So we get a group of people, we get information on them, we calculate or estimate statistics using that information, and we hope that it applies to a more general population and about those population parameters. Parameters is a word that I'm going to use a lot. Um, think of it this way. A parameter is a thing to be found. It's gen I'm just going to define it simply. It is a thing to be found. So if we estimate a model and I have three different explainers, there are three things to be found about those explainers. How do they function in explaining the outcome? Three parameters, three things to be found. We find them in our sample. We never actually get the population unless we define it so narrowly that it would be easy to get it. Like if my population is counseling students in the College of Education at the University of Iowa, I could conceivably get the entire population in my sample. But then someone could ask me, well, why, why that? Why do you want to know about that? And that's not a stats question. That's more of a, um, a theoretical sort of design-based question. So statistics, the things that we find in our sample, are basically used for two purposes. There's descriptive, and that's what, when people ask me, like, what do you do for a living? It's like, oh, I teach applied statistics. Oh, you mean like, like baseball and stuff like that? Uh, no, but <laughs> thanks for playing. <laughs> um, like, you know, your batting average is a statistic. It's a descriptive statistic. You don't do anything with it. It's just there. Um, you know, the median income or the median home price in Coralville is a statistic. It just describes things. Inferential is when you're trying to find statistics to answer questions. You're trying to make conclusions based on that. So you're trying to estimate population values and test hypotheses. Hypotheses are conjectures about some phenomenon. I'm guessing that is a word you guys know, right? Hypothesis? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good, right? So I'm just, I'm making sure, okay? Um, one of the, the downsides of me having taught only the advanced courses is that I sort of forget what should be told and what shouldn't be. And so if I say something and you're like, eh, just please stop me. Oh good, my virus software is being updated in the middle of my lecture. I love that. Okay. Thank you, Windows. Come on. No, you can do it, come on. Really? And it's decided to freeze my computer. 
It's plugged in and everything. Well, let me see. What's next? Any of you print this out? Any paper people? Think? Just need to. I, need, I just need like line, and then I'll get back into the thing here. <laughs> Thank you. Until uh, Sofa stops updating itself. Yeah, I wrote this lecture like two weeks ago, and I don't have it memorized yet. I'm sorry. Oh, it, there we go. It's back. Okay, I'll, can I? No, I'll do this. You printed it for a reason. I did. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. All right, so to test hypotheses, we build a statistical model. It is a mathematical system of relations among two or more variables. That's my definition. So what's a variable? Anything that is not the same for everyone in your sample. So if I ask each of you about your subjective well-being, you'll each give me a different answer. Some of your answers might be in common, and that's okay. It's still a variable. Um, if, in this case, the opposite of a variable is a constant. Anything that is the same. Constants are not variables. Now that sounds, seems obvious, but what that means is that it cannot be explained, and it cannot be an explainer. So we take samples from a population to provide data. Data is synonymous with variables with which to estimate models. We create statistics in order to answer questions about phenomena and populations. So what kinds of samples? These are decisions that you would have made a priori before figuring out your data analyses for the study. And traditionally, there is a back and forth process because you never want to collect data that you don't know what to do with on the back end. That is a recipe for disaster. But these are questions you'd have to answer. So in this fictitious study, uh, looking at um, program membership, stress levels, and subjective well-being in graduate students, do we want everyone from the same program or do we want to have multiple programs? Well, who are you generalizing to? Do you just want to talk about counseling or uh, who else? Let's see, counseling people, raise your hands. Anybody? A couple other. Oh, I knew there was a lot. That's why I went with that one. Where are you all from? Teaching and learning. Teaching and learning. So he's like, do you just want to talk about TNL? Is it TNL or T ampersand L? Ampersand. Ampersand. Because I thought I heard someone say TNL. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so it's the question is, who do you want to generalize to? Multiple programs from the same college, multiple colleges from the same university, multiple universities. It can keep going up and up. Um, do you trust a person's judgment about these things in their life if you only ask them once, like a snapshot? Or would it be better to ask them maybe every day for a week, something like that? I don't know. Probably every day for a week would give you a, a more reliable answer. Um, should we also try to not trust the self-report? So should we try to get the same type of data from other people who know each participant, their family, their friends, etc.? All of these sorts of things about how to extend the sample are questions of what we would refer to as independent versus dependent. Those are terms. Come on, you can do it. There we go. So an example of an independent sample, if we chose to sample only students from the same program, so we made program a constant, then it can't be in any of our models. It can't be explained and it can't be an explainer. Those sorts of data, if you have an independent sample in which people have nothing to do with each other, can be analyzed with univariate models. Remember what uni means? One variable at a time. Now, can you think of a reason why people would be dependent, even from the same program? Dependent is going to mean related. How about advisor? You think people from the same research lab may have more similar levels of well-being or stress? I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to say that. You said that. <laughs> or people who are post-comps or going through comps, right, based on stage, right, there still may be reasons why people are, some people are more related to each other. It's up to you to capture those reasons and put them in the models as variables. That's usually the goal of what we're doing. Um, in the College of Education, most of the time, your data will be characterized as dependent. Dependent just means related. Some people are more related than other people because of things like multiple programs. So if I did sample multiple programs from the same university, people from the same program may be more related because of whatever than people from different programs. 
Um, this is what's known as a clustered sample or a nested sample. That's my next class. So you can stick around if you want to learn about that. Um, and can you think of other things like this? Educational data, clustered or nested samples? Heard these words before? Classrooms. Classrooms, yeah. Kids from the same classroom and thus the same teacher may be more alike than kids from different classrooms and different teachers. Classes from the same school might be more alike than different classes from different schools. Schools from the same district may be more alike than schools from different districts. So yeah, this shows up all the time. Clustered or nested is the key words for that. Um, anytime you sample somebody more than once, this is also relevant. So if we obtained uh, stress rates from the same person at different times, the data from the same person, those outcomes are likely to be more related to each other than outcomes from different people. That's known as dependency. It's phrased, it's not a bad thing necessarily, just you have to plan for it and adjust your models accordingly. Um, this is what's known as repeated measures designs or longitudinal. Um, that's what my textbook is about, it's longitudinal analysis. It's kind of my bread and butter. Um, this also comes into play if you have multiple data about a person from different sources. So in, if you think about the concept of dyadic data, right, you may have um, uh, paired people who are both in a relationship together answer questions about themselves and each other. Then it's like the, the pair is the unit of analysis and then all the responses from the pair are more likely to be related than responses from different pairs. Um, all of these types of data that have dependency of some kind have to be analyzed in a different set of models that's known as multivariate, because you have to be able to put all of those observations that go with that, that unit that they're, that they're sampling from into the model at the same time. Come on, you can do it. So the good news and the bad news. There are lots and lots of models for addressing any kind of dependency you see yourself having. The bad news, we're not going to get there. That's not possible in one class. Um, each of these types of dependency could easily be a full year if you let it, of course, work. Um, the goal of what we're going to do is conditional independence. We're going to try to build models that incorporate all the reasons why people would be more related to each other and put those in. And the model then says that people are conditionally independent after conditioning on those reasons, after taking them into account. We will also get to models that address limited types of sampling dependency. So for in the first example, if the only source of dependency was sampling multiple programs from the same university, once we put in the model as an explainer what program you're from, then it's conditionally independent. After factoring out the influence of program, we're good. Um, also, if you have, say, two outcomes per person, we'll analyze both outcomes at the same time in a special type of multivariate model, we're good. So if you have repeated measures of these sort of types, we're good with that. Um, this is a, a sort of an advanced topic, but I bring it up here. Um, if you have questions about mediation, we're not gonna get there. That's next semester. That's special types of models in which the same variable is both a predictor with respect to other variables and an outcome with respect to others. So if you don't know what that means, no worries, but we're not getting there. So this is truth in advertising, what we can and what we can't do. If you want to, to do the others, come back. Stay the, stay the afternoon with me. It'll be fun. Or watch my YouTube channel, right? You can do it from the, the comfort of your own home. All right, so more vocabulary. Let me, before I jump into this, do you have questions? Any of that that you want to hear again? I know these are a lot of words. We're going to keep saying them over and over this semester, so I just wanted to throw them out there to make sure I define them before we jump in. According to my Fitbit, I've stopped burning fat, so apparently I'm starting to settle down. When I first got here, I was in my fat burning so I was a little, <laughs> little hyped up. Did you tell you that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, well, it's based on like your target heart rate, so it's, it's sort of algorithmic, but it knows my heart rate, so no worries. By the way, I should mention if my phone ever goes off, it's my babysitter, sorry, his daycare, and I'm probably going to take it. So, you know, he has a fever, or he hit somebody, or he fell off the playground, you know. I have a four-year-old son, so he's at uh, the Montessori school. Yes, you'll get to know Huey quite well. He'll be the subject of many anecdotes and things. <laughs> So, yes. All right. No questions? 
No, we're good? Okay, so synonyms. So this could drive you bonkers if you let it, or you could harness this as an opportunity. Because the more words you know that mean the same thing, the more likely someone you're talking to can follow you. So I have thrown up here everything that I can think of that goes in one of these two columns. Um, so in terms of variables, when they go into a model, when they are placed in a question, they are either going to be explainers or what is to be explained, reasons or to be explained. In the models themselves, in the mathematical equations, explainers are going to be x's and what is to be explained are going to be y's. I'm going to try to keep that consistent because it's easier if you know what to expect. Synonyms for this that you may see in, um, who are the EPLS folks, anybody from there? Yes. Endogenous versus exogenous, are those words you know? Yeah, so um, I used to get those confused a lot because they sound so similar, but just think that exogenous has the X in it. <laughs> so it's a predictor. And endogenous is the other one, so why? Um, in path diagrams of these models, there's arrows that go into endogenous boxes, and so that's the other way I remember is that it's going, arrows going in to the endogenous. Uh, what's in bold is what I'm gonna say, predictor and outcome. That's my language. That's what I will default to most of the time. Um, in experimental settings, you may also hear predictors called independent variables, or IV for short. Those are typically things that are under experimental control. So if you randomly assign someone to a treatment group versus a control, we would call that an IV for the design. The synonym for that then, the, they're not the synonym, excuse me, the, the complement to that is dependent variable for DV. Same means the same thing as outcome. Um, I will also throw in here the word covariate. That has two special definitions. To me, it's, it's synonymous with predictor. But the way that most people use it is to refer to a variable that they don't care about, but someone else wants them to care. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's true. It sounds I like mean, all of the PhDs. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I, f I found that, you know, smoking causes cancer. And it's like, oh, but, but did you consider socioeconomic status? <laughs> Reviewer 3 wants you to think about all the reasons, right? So it's like, fine, I put in SES as a covariate. So it's, it's an explainer that you don't care about is usually the term, that, the way that people talk about it. So you care about your predictors and your IVs. Someone else cares about your covariate. Uh, but this clearly is not a statistical distinction. This is an interpretation. One person's covariate is someone else's career. Right? At one point, that was not a covariate. That was a thing. And I am reviewer three, and I'm going to keep it a thing. It's going in your model. <laughs> Um, in SPSS, in the boxes, covariate is what the box is called for any kind of quantitative variable that means numbers. Um, I don't know why they did that, but just as an FYI. But that, that's how I use it. So I'm going to stick with predictor and outcome um, for the most part, but these are other things that you would hear. Criterion is something that you would hear in a regression context, so it's a very specific type of model. We're going to do those models, but we don't necessarily need to change our, our words. So, questions? Good. All right. Any that I forgot? Can you think of any others that you've heard before in this context? No? Are you happy with predictor and outcome? Roll with that? Okay. All right. So, not done yet. Okay. So, let's practice here. Here are some example questions that I came up with. What do you think are the predictors and outcomes in the questions based on how they're worded? So, let's, uh, let's do this together, shall we? Let me see. No. Escape. No. Maybe not. Uh, end show. Yes, I wanted to type. Thank you. So first one, to what extent does positive feedback improve performance speed and accuracy more than negative feedback? What's my predictor? Positive feedback. Yeah. Feedback type, we'll call it, since they're listing distinct types of the uh, Positive and neutral. Yeah. What's an outcome then? Speed and accuracy. Yeah. So that means that we know off the bat we could analyze each of these separately, 
right? We could ask the question, does feedback type predict speed? That's one question. Does feedback type predict accuracy? That's another question. Can you think of a reason why we might want to do them both at the same time? Heard, ever heard of a speed accuracy trade-off? The faster you go, the harder it is to be accurate. You might want to know if that's happening, right? So that would be an argument for building what we would call a multivariate model, where we predict both at the same time. So not only can we answer the question of how feedback predicts each, but how they relate to each other in the process. So univariate would be feedback type predicting either. Multivariate would be predicting both. Next one, is faster academic growth in elementary school related to more frequent reading to children when in preschool? So reading frequency? Is which one? Predictors. Predictors. So yeah, see what I did there? I worded it backwards. X Does X predict Y is my preferred way of doing it, but not everybody does it that way. Is Y predicted by X is equally valid. So the predictor, yes. Frequency of reading, we'll call it that. What's the outcome? Academic growth. So I'm going to pause you there. <laughs> Academic something is what I'm going to write down. In order to know if someone grows, what do you need in your study? Where they started and where they ended up, right? That means you have to sample them at least twice, right? So what's my other predictor that's implied by this question but not stated explicitly? Time. Time. Yeah, exactly. This is an example of a longitudinal model. Let's see, I'm pitching my other classes. We're not getting to that one unless it's pre-post. I can get you pre-post, but anything past that is another class. How effective is teacher training for creating higher rates of positive feedback? Ah, it's kind of like... Uh, like training efficacy? Yeah. yeah. Training efficacy. Let me spell it correctly. Eh? All right. This is an example of a hard-to-answer question. If this were my question, I'd work on trying to rephrase it, right? What do you mean by effective? Yeah. You mean it gets better? Gets worse? Uh, is more responsive when it needs to be better? Like, eh? But we'll, we'll just... Feedback for there you go. Outcome? Rates of feedback. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw that attention to that because that changes the story in terms of how you would think about that variable as an outcome. So. Can you be specific and say positive feedback? Yes. Yes, you do. Thank you for catching that. Yes, not being specific will sink your grant proposal. <laughs> Do not make the reviewers guess if you meant positive feedback. That's what I've said. Sorry, I have a little post t uh, PTSD from the past couple of weeks here. Um, it's going to come out. So I love grants. They're the best. <laughs> All right. Uh, wait, let me see here. What's OK. Yeah, want two more slides, and I think that'll be a good place to stop. So in terms of inference, remember, we have statistics or for description or for inference. In talking about relationships, there's two ways that you could describe it. One is causal and one is associative. You may have heard these terms in other research methods courses, maybe? No? Okay, well, let me tell you about it then. Um, this is a whole set of courses onto itself, just, but this distinction, I think, is it's pretty black and white if you make it this way. Um, if you want to say that X causes Y, smoking causes cancer, there are at least three things that have to be true. X had to come first. X had to be under the complete control of the study. So in this case, we would have to randomly assign some people to be smokers and some people not to be smokers, and then watch them all try to not die. And the study design would have to eliminate all other confounders that would go into that. That's tough. Do, are, do any of you work with non-people in research? like rats or plants or anything like that? No? OK, well, I'm just, I'm just going to X this whole top thing here. Pretty much in studies with people, causal inference is near impossible. 
So we're just, we're going to do the second one. The language that I'm going to teach you is going to be associative because that's probably what you're going to need most of the time. Because, yeah, you can't actually say that smoking causes cancer because you can't randomly assign people to be smokers or not. Like, that is just a fundamental block because of, you know, ethics and morality and stuff like that. But we can say that smoking is related to cancer. So that is an example of an associative or a correlational statement. That's where we're at. We have observed a relationship. We can't say what causes what. We can just say they're related to each other. Um, what people do in this case to try to rule out alternative explanations is rather than experimental control, they do statistical control. They put those alternative explanations into the model and see if their X and Y are still related. So maybe it's not that smoking is related to cancer, it's that people who are lower SES have more likely to have cancer because they don't have good doctors, et cetera, et cetera, and they're more likely to be smokers. Okay, well, I can't prove any of that, but what I can do is see if smoking is still related to cancer after I join SES into the model. And I can see if SES is related to cancer after controlling for smoking, vice versa. That's the kind of thing that we're going to learn how to do. That's the kind of thing that you're stuck with in studies of real people. So these possibilities are only about design. Um, it's something that sometimes people don't understand because of this word right here, correlational. You're going to learn a statistic called a correlation. That statistic is agnostic as to whether it's associative or causal because that comes from design. You could have a causal correlation if you had the right kind of design. So everything we're doing is associative, whether or not it involves correlations. So that's what we're up to. So the steps in data analysis, we are going to get practice in every single one of these. Um, the process of applying models to data to answer questions. So this is presupposing you already have questions. So step one, enter, download, or otherwise acquire your quantitative data. Import it into software and verify its accuracy. We'll get practice with that. Um, describe your data, univariate statistics and bivariate measures of association. Those can also help you verify your accuracy. Then the hard part, the part why I make the big bucks or I have a job, one of the two, <laughs> right? It's all relative. Select the family of statistical models based on the characteristics of the variables of interest and the questions to be answered. This has nothing to do with math. This is entirely logic. There is a series of constraints. If this, then this, if this, then this, if this, then this, and you memorize them, or otherwise figure out sort of where you are in that network, and that's where you land here. That takes a lot of practice, but we're gonna get a good start on that this semester. Once you're, you figure out what you're gonna do, then comes the time to make the software do the work for you. You estimate the models, you check for potential problems, things you've left out, things that don't make sense. Make sure everything is comprehensive. More models, check again. More models, more models, more models. Eventually, you get to the point where you think you have a story and you gotta write it up. Generating a results section. So rather than teaching you how to write directly, what I'm hoping to do is to provide you with the results sections in the homework that give you templates to, for your writing in the future. I found that to be a little more efficient um, in terms of my time and your time and providing a good example. Um, just some things to keep in mind when you're writing. I cringe when I see these things um, in publications, let alone theses and dissertations. People say they run analyses. No, rats run mazes. We conduct analyses. And we don't calculate models, we estimate models. Even models that could be done through hand calculations are <clears throat> estimated. Those are the words that you want to use. All right, I think that's a good stopping point for now. Um, these lectures, by the way, I've never given them before. I have no idea how long they're going to take. So if I get behind, I'm just going to keep moving stuff down the page of the syllabus, and you'll always see what we're planning to do um, each day. So if we don't finish this, we'll pick it up next time, and we'll go to, uh, and then we'll go to the next one. So. Questions, comments? All right, then away you go. Enjoy the rest of your first day of school. Let me know if you need anything. I guess second day of school, first for me. Sorry.